to the organisers and for everyone participating today. I'm very appreciative of the opportunity to um, speak with everyone. And hopefully today I can um, respectfully outline uh, a few potentially controversial areas that really are shared in the spirit of um, a collegiate discussion about uh, the specifics of ethics, healthcare and medicine in relation to um, queer people. I won't really be covering um, some of the basics in terms of language other than to say that frequently I will use the, the phrase queer people um, and I recognise that that's not always uh, all that there are limitations in doing so and but it is something that comes from a long tradition of reclaiming language that has been used in harmful ways in order to reduce the ability for people to use that um, in, in destructive and harmful uh, ways. So moving along, to begin with, I wanted to provide an example that really sort of sharpens our mind about healthcare ethics, health and research ethics um, in relation to queer people. In 2023, there was an article um, published uh, from a group of researchers that essentially observed the pathway of 79 children accessing a gender services clinic in a, an Australian tertiary setting. The One of the major obvious pitfalls with this article is that they took the 11 subjects who did not meet the criteria for the study and were not offered gender affirming treatment and they added those to the, uh, the one who ceased and the five who altered their pathway to generate what they referred to as a desistance rate of around about 22%. Um, without speculating as to what the underlying motivation for doing so was, the effect of that is that that headline rate became widely known within mainstream media, generated complex and difficult scenarios where parents and families were vilified for trying to do the best that they could for their child who self-identified as having a diverse gender. And it was also, it coincided in time with one of Australia's largest providers of medical indemnity insurance, um, removing coverage for doctors, providing gender affirming care for people under 18 years of age. Now that's a very big problem because in terms of the options for gender affirming care, if you fail to take some action to preserve your options prior to puberty, there are irreversible changes and the, the opportunity to um, allow a person to have the full range of gender affirming options at a later stage will be lost. And certainly within some of the mainstream media that represents this issue, the idea of medications that block puberty is conflated with surgical gender affirming treatment options. And it's presented in a very simplistic way that invites the solution that of course, you should just delay until these uh, people are over 18 years of age and we can be certain that they've provided informed consent. And that really doesn't reflect the complexity of the issue there. The other thing that can be represented is that it's an obvious and foregone conclusion that the family court should re reassert its jurisdiction, even in cases where the child, the treating clinician, the parents and the family all agree and 
there has been a period of time where those cases are very much um, not taken to the family court and that really trims between 12 to 18 months of waiting time and around $30,000 off the costs. And um, so we need to be very mindful that, um, first of all, if we're talking about the conclusions from studies, particularly in this area, that the actual study design and data collected supports the conclusions and that the wider community is not going to be vilified for those conclusions. And also that the, the confounding factors in terms of recruitment for um, participants in a study are truly known and understood. And certainly in the past when um, homosexuality was categorized as a mental illness, the research that really debunked that uh, misconception highlighted that all of the studies were done on people who were recruited from uh, by accessing mental health services and there was an inherent um, bias in doing so and that when you had samples of homosexual people who were not accessing mental health care they had um, equal health outcomes to uh, other members of society and there was uh, and that mental illness was not an inherent feature of homosexuality. So there's absolutely no way I can get across everything today and this is really just about providing a quick snapshot um, and maybe to generate some ideas really looking at what are the relevant considerations for people of diverse gender, sex characteristics and sexuality? How can we use that understanding to you know, improve the work that we do and improve outcomes for um, individuals in the community? Briefly, there is a lot of reform underway in this particular area. And um, I would encourage people to have a look at the NHMRC's draft statement on sex, gender, uh, diverse sex characteristics and sexual orientation in health and medical research. I think that consultation is open until about the 15th of December. Um, but also the Australian Medical Council are doing a lot of great work in terms of improving medical curricula across Australia and New Zealand. Um, the AMA have a um, fairly comprehensive position statement on LGBTI health. And there is a current project uh, that is a joint initiative of the Royal Australian College of Medical Administrators and the federal government that's called A Better Culture, which is looking at reforming the culture um, across the medical profession. So anyone who has a specific interest in these sorts of um, topics, I'd really encourage you to have a look at some of those sites. Now, we are not going to be able to improve the overall health of the queer community um, without the um, skills, expertise, effort and resources of the mainstream. And really the idea that the queer community is something separate is only generated from um, some of the uh, social and cultural dynamics and the history of those um, as they operate. And really, uh, the queer community is roughly 5% of every single community, and we are part of Australian families. And so when we look at the determinants of health for the community, while it's important to look at um, queer community controlled health service delivery, um, there is a group of people who will never intersect with those services, and we'll get to that a little bit later. Now, uh, just a quick note, this talk isn't necessarily to cover um, the field in terms of people with diverse sex characteristics, but I would briefly point people to the Darlington Statement, which is a consensus statement from um, several human rights organisations in the area. Um, I'd refer people to Intersex Human Rights Australia, 
um, which is .org.au. Otherwise, you will find yourself at the Inter International Hot Rod Association of Australia. Um, the issues in terms of uh, people with diverse sex characteristics, they're estimated to comprise about 1.7% of every population. And these are estimates that are provided and used by the um, Office of the UN Human Rights Commissioner. The issues here are largely around bodily integrity, autonomy and self-determination, um, but there are other very important messages that you can find within these, um, within the Darlington Statement and other resources. And I'd really encourage people who aren't familiar to maybe just have a, a brief read of those documents and uh, at least have them in your awareness. Now, there's quite a few um, what I call beguiling conceptual pitfalls. And one of the first is that uh, anti-discrimination efforts are characterised as cherry picking of isolated incidents. And I guess that's what anti-discrimination kind of is. It's, it's looking for areas where something operates in a way in which it's not intended. Um, but a lot of these things can actually be systematic. Um, they can involve knowledge gaps or unconscious bias, and it's fair and reasonable to take steps to mitigate that. Also, inclusion is really core business, and everyone deserves the benefit of research, and everyone deserves the benefits of reasonable efforts to ensure safety for everyone, every time. Um, in terms of general statements being sufficient, um, that can really allow knowledge gaps and unconscious bias to go unaddressed and is very much a missed opportunity. Um, the discussion around wanting equality and simultaneously wanting special treatment is really a mischaracterization of expecting the same diligent and thorough consideration of the needs of queer people based on a sound knowledge and uh, sufficient competency to undertake those considerations. Um, and then you can sometimes come across people who see variation in the individual opinions of members of the queer community as somehow reducing the validity of the content. And I think that's really a function of a couple of things. The first is expecting that any single individual is an expert on that particular attribute and that they can cover the field and explain that in a dispassionate academic manner without necessarily having any specific knowledge or um, training or expertise beyond their individual lived experience, um, which obviously is very important. However, uh, you know, when we talk about um, perhaps the needs of people with a disability, uh, we really focus on ensuring that the people that we are um, accessing for opinion actually have special knowledge and um, can contribute in that way. The uh, anyway, moving along. So what can we learn from the Nuremberg Code uh, in relation to queer people? When the Nuremberg Code was developed in the aftermath of Nazi Germany, um, when the liberating forces entered Germany, queer people were the only population who faced the ongoing prospect of incarceration and they were seen as legitimate prisoners. Uh, they received no war reparations and the history of queer people in the Holocaust was erased for many years. Any attempt to correct that came with significant legal peril for those who attempted to do so. And the importance of that is that even under the Nuremberg Code, ethical research in relation to a characteristic such as homosexuality really was considered to be research on the eradication of that trait. 
And if we think about the way that we might consider the special ethical needs of um, people who are incarcerated, we don't conduct research on encouraging reoffending, and that's really the difference here that we're looking at. This is why general statements really um, are quite concerning because it allows for, you know, perhaps a, a justification of um, uh, ideologies or an outlook that isn't really supported by the community and isn't for the benefit of the queer community. Now, the Australian Health Ethics Committee, as everyone would be familiar, um, is created under the NHMRC Act in Section 36. And the Act places members onto that committee with, according to specific skills, knowledge and expertise. Um, and the two that I would really want to draw people's attention to is the specific inclusion of a person who has knowledge and expertise in the needs of people with a disability. And the Act also places a member on the committee with expertise in religion. Now, the Act also requires council members and committee members to disclose any interest that may relate to the activity of the council or committee. And when we look at the language and we look at the way that the there's a there's a Commonwealth Act called the Acts Interpretation Act, and um, it's basically a piece of law that provides guidance on how to read law. And when a specific choice is made to use different terminology or language, there is usually an intention of the parliament in using that language quite specifically. Now, in this instance, any interest is a little bit different to that that we find in the Corporations Act and the case law that surrounds that, where um, directors of a company and senior officers of a company really are looking at disclosing and managing uh, material personal interests. And so the use of the language any interest really provides a lower bar or a lower threshold for considering a particular interest to be um, relevant to the functions of the committee or the council. And the point here is this, the Act places a person with expertise in religion on the Australian Health Ethics Committee. It's clear that religion is central to the functions of the Australian Health Ethics Committee. And therefore, personal affiliations with religious organisations ought to be a disclosable personal interest. And doing so would really provide an opportunity for that interest to be managed and for a process where we can really look for, you know, the underlying cognitive bias that might be operating um, and the nature of unconscious bias is you're never aware that you have it. Um, so I think that in the future, we will look at the possibility of disclosing um, religious affiliations when there is a potential perception that that could be influencing the, con the conduct of that research. And that's particularly important when the affiliation is with an organisation who publicly promote ideas or positions that we know can be harmful to queer people. Now, rather than sort of spend a great deal of time discussing how religion can negatively impact queer people, if we look to the 2003 judgment of the um, Supreme Court of the USA, in the case of Lawrence v. Texas, um, this case overturned the anti-sodomy laws in Texas. Um, so 2003 is when the USA achieved full decriminalization. The 
the majority judgment in that case quoted um, Chief Justice Berger from 1986 when he stated that condemnation of homosexuality was firmly rooted in Judeo-Christian moral and ethical standards. And when he made that quote, he did so uh, in a way where it was a justification for not overturning the anti-sodomy laws of Georgia. And so we can see the way that these things um, can operate and religion is a highly potent um, influence on thoughts, feelings, decisions and conduct. And for those reasons, um, I would uh, put forward the proposition that we consider disclosing and managing these interests. It's not something that uh, is incompatible, it's just something that can be well managed. So the difficult questions here are, is there an appearance that the Australian Health Ethics Committee or indeed the NH and MRC have undisclosed conflicting interests? And is it reasonable that there is an apprehension of influence from that unconscious bias or knowledge gaps that is present within the queer community? And how does the, the decision not to include queer people in chapter four of the National Statement on Ethical Conduct in Research, how is that decision and the validity of that decision affected by these processes and the failure to perhaps identify and disclose um, these material personal interests? The, I guess the proposition here is that if we can create an awareness that there can be systems and policies that without intending to disadvantage people based on sexuality, gender or sex characteristics, that it is still possible to have the unintended consequence of systematically disadvantaging that group of people, then once we're aware of that, we really have an opportunity to refine, improve, and become more effective. Any, any policy that does have an unintended consequence of systematically disadvantaging one group is really the criteria for what we would call indirect discrimination. Now, I just wanna press on to the Australian Medical Council. They provide the accreditation standards and graduate outcome statements that apply to all 24 medical schools across Australia and New Zealand. They also have a similar role in relation to specialist colleges and their education programs. And they have a, a dual role in relation to international medical graduates in that they both set the standards and deliver the pathway. In 2023, for the first time, they have created their first specific criteria for queer health. And this criteria relates to non-discrimination in access to health care. The obvious question here being, if you don't have both technically and culturally competent clinicians to access, there is no ability to have non-discriminatory access to healthcare. In terms of the easiest area to gather data and to establish this, I looked at the composition of general practice in Australia and approximately 52% of the full-time equivalent of Australian general practice is the contribution of international medical graduates. And they make an excellent contribution to the health and well-being of Australian society. The, the issue here is that of that 52%, 47% obtained their medical degree in a country that criminalises homosexuality, 7% by death. And so it's at extremely elevated risk that their medical training contained uh, unscientific misrepresentations of queer people. 
and uh, I, I, I refer to this as prejudicial prior learning, which really speaks to the fact that teaching to a knowledge gap is very different to teaching to pre-existing incorrect knowledge. And it requires a thoughtful, uh, deliberate strategy that helps to support all clinicians to provide safe care for their patients. Um, there's certainly no doctor who wants to um, be harming their patients and everyone deserves to be supported with uh, the necessary education and awareness to be able to create um, a safe healthcare environment for everyone. So all healthcare research and ethics occurs within the context of the society. And if we look at Australia, um, we fully decriminalised in Australia in 1997, um, which is, you know, fairly recent history. There are a cohort of um, families with children who are raising their children um, based on the knowledge and awareness that they acquired when they were growing up. And um, the, I guess the other things that I would specifically point out is that marriage equality occurred in 2017, whilst um, interracial marriage was a uh, scenario dealt with many decades earlier. Um, and sort of in more recent history uh, in this decade, we've seen the, uh, the passing of laws to remove the um, reduced culpability for murdering gay men um, known as the gay panic defence. So these are all important um, areas of progress, but they influence the underlying um, outlook and uh, assumptions that we can have. Now, what are the important characteristics of the queer community we need to think about in reference to their health and well-being? The first is there isn't a vertical inheritance of the trait, and so you don't get effective uh, transmission of cultural knowledge from one generation to the next. For 200 years, any investment in the community was essentially an investment in a criminal organisation. So the organisations are relatively young, um, and undercapitalized. There's not traditionally been a town hall or meeting space for the community, and any that do arise have a financial imperative, often alcohol, gambling, or healthcare um, are probably the most frequent, and that supports the creation of those spaces. The exception being the Pride Centre in Melbourne, which is, uh, to my knowledge, a bit of a world first, and that building co-locates a whole range of queer community organisations and um, provides a central meeting place for the community. Now, if we think about queer children in particular, there is a widespread, widespread assumption that sexuality and personality for heterosexual children is a normal process of development throughout adolescence. But when we look at queer children, it's less commonly understood that that is also a normal, healthy period of development for that child. And if we break down what is unique about queer children, we can think about this extended period where neither a child or the parent is aware of that child's eventual diverse identity. And during this period, the child has no natural psychological filter to assimilating information that will subsequently be incompatible with dignity and self-respect. The parent, also unaware of the child's potential eventual identity may not be well placed to protect the child from the assimilation of that information. And also that child may not observe their parent being protective. And that's an important factor. There's a second phase where a child may have an evolving awareness of their own identity. 
And during this phase, it can be characterized or it can be associated with um, apprehension, fear, um, and, uh, you know, for some children, a, a realization that in their particular religion, um, they are this terrible thing that they have been taught is abhorrent to their God. And in that moment, they are really disconnected from their family, disconnected from their community, and disconnected from their spirituality. There's another phase where a child might be aware of their diverse identity, but they haven't made any disclosures. And this can be characterised by meticulous observation of language and behaviour of caregivers and the community, because for that child, they are completely dependent on their parents and family for survival. And so we can understand this as a pervasive, low-grade threat to their life and their existence, and that chronic pervasive stress can go on for several years. And if we compare that to an adult deployed in a stressful environment for a fixed period of time with wraparound institutional support and safe adult friends to talk to, we can understand some of the potential impacts there. Um, I'm aware that I'm running quite late for time, so I just wanted to check, Leonie, do I need to start wrapping it up or? Yes. Yes, James, please. Uh, we're way right over time and it's been so interesting, but you do. I think we can finish up. I just, oh. I guess the, the, the core feature there is to really think about how, um, you know, this high rate of discordance between the identity of the parent and the identity of the child really is comparable to um, very specific populations, such as a child with a disability, intercultural adoptions, um, the stolen generation, and there are perhaps a couple of other examples that people might be able to come up with. And there are specific public health strategies that support families with education and awareness to make the best decisions for the long-term best interests for their child. Thank you, James. Um, the, that was such an interesting presentation um, and I particularly appreciated your rainbow slides. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much to all the uh, presenters in this session. They're all so diverse and so very interesting and I really appreciate your time today. Thank you very much. Um, James, I just will say that, that uh, I think, you know, it was a really fascinating talk and, and you're very sensitive, but um, as, as Father Des says, for example, not all religious groups speak of a child's sexuality being against God. Um, when you talked about Section 4, you know, there are so many groups that you could have could have been in Section 4 of a national statement. I mean, it's uh, I completely take your point, but I think, you know, it just has to be broader than, than it currently is. And I don't think it can be in the way it is currently written. But, you know, I think you raised some, some awesome points. There is one question in the Q&A. James, how important is language used in the discussions going forward? Uh, this is from Gary. Just thinking about common language terms used, who understands what, etc. cetera. Mm. I guess I'd say a couple of things. If we think about, you know, a, a queer child growing up, and they, their primary mechanism for figuring out whether or not they're safe in their family or community is the language that's used. That really, I think, um, can generate empathy and understanding as to why language can be so important for the queer community, because it really is adjacent to some very stressful childhood experiences. And you can very quickly tell if you're in a safe place or not by the language that's used. And so when you are looking to engage people in research or healthcare, um, it is very easy to accidentally use language that isn't inclusive. And so that obviously can affect the quality of the data that you're getting, but it can also make people wonder about the level of good faith that's um, behind the particular um, study or intervention. And I guess one strategy that I would say, you know, certainly for clinicians is sometimes it's handy to proactively um, safety net some of that by saying, I'm very supportive. Um, it's not my intention to be disruptive. I'm not perfect and I don't get everything right all the time. Um, if I use language that is a bit disruptive, 
let me know and I'm happy to learn. Um, so, but the uh, the statement on that the NHMRC is currently working on on sex, gender variation of sex characteristics and sexual um, orientation is absolutely excellent. And I think that that's going to provide some really handy guidance. Um, and I'd encourage people to uh, seek that out and to become familiar with with that document because the the quality of it is absolutely excellent. James, uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Uh, and, and we again.